Good morning, everyone. How are we all doing this morning? Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. My name is Leah, and it is my honor that I get to welcome you here this morning at Church for the City. If you are joining us online, can we just say hi to our online campus? If it's your first time here today, we want to connect with you. Go ahead and text guest to the number that's on the screen or stop by the connect table on the way out. We have some lovely people there that just want to meet with you and connect with you and walk through this amazing life with you together. I'm going to read from the word this morning. First Chronicles 29 11 says this, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Can we just go before the Lord this morning in prayer? God, yours is the victory and the majesty and the power, and we fix our eyes on you this morning, Lord. We readjust our gaze, God, on our King that is on the throne. Father, we're so excited that we get to come together as a church and worship you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come on, church, let's stand and sing. How many of you can testify to the faithfulness of God, the sovereignty of God? Come on, let's just rejoice together as a church sing of his goodness today.
All right, church, let's turn our attention to the screen as somebody goes public with their faith. My name is Albert. Before I had a personal connection with God, I believed in, in Him, but then I never pray or go to church. I always had a, car a caring family, but never felt like I fit in. I had all the reasons to be happy, but felt depressed. Yet, yet felt depressed. My life turn took a turn of events when my grandparents passed away early 2020. My father was diagnosed with cancer. <laughs> passed away August 26. <laughs> I fell into depression, which later turned in thoughts of, into thoughts of suicide. My wife always had a encouragement, encouraged me to seek the Word of God and never stopped believing in me. I began to attend the CTC because my daughter was going to youth group. I noticed a personal positive change in her, in which made me curious to attend. In which, on, and it wasn't until March 19th when Pastor Ad, Andrew shared a po powerful message of pain and suffering. As, an, as a result of that, I have opened my life and heart entirely to God, and He is what He is the one to take away the feeling of sadness, depression, and suicidal thoughts, which is why I have I have hope. And today I'm going public with my faith. Albert, Jesus said every disciple should be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because of your confession of faith today, I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And according to the scripture, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Moses rejoices all of heaven today. What a powerful testimony. Just remember that the same God that moved in his life is the same God that can move in your life today. Come on, let's sing this out.
a treasure it is to know you, to commune with you, to, to worship you in your presence, Lord. We thank you for the sacrifice of Christ and the defeat over the grave, that you tore the veil, that you made yourself accessible. God, that we became sons and daughters of God, the righteousness of God because of the blood of Jesus. God, we thank you for this moment, Lord. God, we submit this to you, Lord. We thank you. We love you. It's in the powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. What an amazing time of worship together. We're going to transition now. We're going to go into what we call a mente mingle. Uh, feel uh, free to go ahead and greet people around you. There's some you never, never met before. Um, just let them know you're thankful that you're here in the house today. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, boys and girls. Welcome to Church for the City, where you encounter the reality and the presence of the Almighty God. Uh, so glad you're with us. I had a wonderful time last weekend in the Civic Center. It was great, but it's, it's no place like home. I like like being in the house, like being here with you, like just uh, being in a place where the Spirit of the Lord dwells. Amen. Um, I, I want to introduce a, a family here, uh, the Liggetts. Uh, we have uh, Isaac and Alexis and Alexa, which gets real interesting at home. Alexa, open the door. Alexa, turn off the lights. But yeah, Alexa, play the music. So it gets interesting at home, but we got Alexa and we also got... Uh, uh, AJ, um, they inspired a project that the city of Yuma is doing at uh, the Wetlands Park and the Stuart Wolf Playground there. Uh, encourage, and, and they inspired the city to move in a direction to redo that playground area so that it's inclusive play. Inclusive play uh, means more than people like AJ in the wheelchair that can just get up there and see people but there's things that they can actually do from their wheelchair. It's a wonderful thing. Um, very proud of this family, uh, good business people in our, in our city. We partner with the city on raising the money for this project. It's 200,000 that's needed. I think it's at 76,000 or so uh, right now. Um, we, we partner with the city because number one, we love our city. And number two, we love families no matter what challenges that they have and we want to partner with them in that. And so, so they're going to share, and then I'll just give you a few, in, a few instructions. They, they have the mic for me. Thank you, Pastor. We want to start off by saying, disability is an open-ended club, and anyone at any time can join. We did with the birth of our son. He is perfectly created, limited edition by God. He has given our lives so much purpose, Many, many in our own same shoes would tell you that we wouldn't change a thing. People with disabilities promote, inspire, problem solving, innovation, and creativity. They spark humanity and empathy. Most importantly, love ones like ours going through medical adversaries, adversities and disabilities bring people closer to God, which are all things the world is definitely always in need of. So with that, um, can you imagine sitting at a park and watching everyone else have so much fun without you? Watching everyone else playing. Can you imagine not being able to enjoy the simple pleasure of going to the park as a family because one of your loved ones will be left out? Our family is crushed by seeing our eight-year-old daughter have so much fun 
at her favorite park while our son, a little adrenaline junkie, only gets to watch. Some of us know that feeling of being stuck on the sidelines and not being included. The disability community, more often than not, and not by choice. But we're turning our frown upside down and raising money in order to bring universally designed wheelchair inclusive equipment pieces and communication boards to Yuma's Castle Park. Thank you. What is, what is so amazing about the pieces that we're working to bring is that everyone will get to play together. That's right, everyone including both children and adults who are wheelchair users, like veterans, first responders, and everyone in between, will all get to play right alongside their loved ones. These pieces of equipment are popping up across the nation, but the first ever We Go Swing delivered to Arizona is for Yuma's own Castle Park. So far, we've raised about $76,000, and we cannot thank everyone that has helped in making that happen and is making this happen. We are still continuing to fundraise, and we hope that Yuma can also be the first in all of Arizona to have all three wheelchair-inclusive pieces in one park, right behind cities like LA, which just opened theirs last year. When we've been able to take AJ to these pieces, it's a blessing to see all the kids using them they notice AJ, they just let him on, and they all continue playing together without skipping a beat. These kids that are sparked by empathy and humanity, there are medical professionals, teachers, um, musicians that praise God's glory and that we will all be touched by in one way or another someday. It really is a beautiful thing. This will be experienced by all in Yuma and not having to drive hours and hours away. There are many families just like ours, but it wasn't until we were blessed with AJ to come into our lives that it opened our eyes to it. Thank you, and we hope you will be a part of this project. Thank you guys so much. We're gonna pray for you. Um, I want to pray for the family, as you can imagine. Uh, of course, they own, the, own a business here in town at, because of the challenges that AJ has any given time. Uh, you know, they have to drop everything and be in Phoenix three, four, five days at a time. Sometimes it's been weeks. So we just want to pray for them. They have a wonderful attitude. I mean, they, they just go through this with the grace of God. They have faith. They just stay encouraged. I'm just so blessed watching them uh, on how they've handled some of the, some of the, I would say, tragic stuff that they've had to walk through. Now, there's going to be a table out there. Uh, uh, Alexa's sister is there. Uh, we have a certain amount that we're going to give from CTC if you want to be part of that. Uh, however you give, whether it be online, whether it be uh, a check or whatever, you can put on there, inclusive play park, and we'll add that to what we're going to do. But there's also a receptacle there on the table. Listen, anything you give, $10, $20, $50, $100, anything you give helps us get to this goal of getting this uh, inclusive play park for families such as the Liggetts. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you. Uh, thank you, first of all, for being in the house of God and being with the dear church family here and the people of God here. We're grateful for an opportunity to worship, which has been amazing today. Looking forward to sharing the word of God and certainly asking for your help and your anointing that people's lives will be transformed. People's lives will be changed. Lord, I thank you for this family. I thank you for the inspiration they've given to the city. I thank you, Lord God, for the work that's being done. And uh, Lord, I'm thankful for the city, the city leadership that's taken this on with a real passion, really seeing how much this will enhance our city and the lives of so many. So I pray, Lord God, that you will provide. Let there be nothing lacking. Lord, touch our hearts, touch people's hearts across this community. We're believing you, Lord God, that we will, this project will be fulfilled. Give this family grace. Lord, give them grace as they raise their family, as they run their business. Lord God, as they walk through those challenges that they, they face on a regular basis, give them grace, give them peace. Lord, may they walk in the love, the kindness, and the goodness of you. Lord, be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Thank you so much.
All right, I'm going to ask you, if you would, uh, to stand with your Bible, and we're going to go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, we're going to look at one verse there, and then I'll, uh, yeah, we'll take it from there. One verse in John 10, and then uh, there'll be some other verses that will be on the screen. John chapter 10. If you have it, say amen. amen. Verse 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Can you say amen? amen. You can be seated. I do uh, believe that the best description of life is from one who lived life uh, pretty hardcore, uh, one that live life full speed ahead. He did this with divine wisdom. The scripture says that he was the wisest man on the, on the, on the earth other than Jesus. And full of wisdom. So he lived this life with all the wisdom that he had. He also had no financial boundaries, no financial restrictions. He actually had no other authority over his life except God, who I do believe that he honored, he recognized, and um, actually had a relationship with God. But we'll see parts of his life uh, in which he did not allow the Lord to be the Lord of his life. And this, this one was no other than, than King Solomon. King Solomon seemed to follow a quote that I read by Ray, Ray Bradbury that, that says, life is trying things to see if they work. And it's almost as if Solomon done everything that he did to see exactly what would work and what would hit the mark. But he, he came to a, a conclusion, and most of the book of Ecclesiastes deals with what his conclusions are or his assessment is. I'm going to read from chapter 2. This will be on the screen. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And listen to this. I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure. Look for the good things in life. But I found that this too was meaningless. So I said, laughter is silly. What good does it do to seek pleasure? After much thought, I decided to cheer myself with wine. And while still seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. In this way, I tried to experience the only happiness most people find during their belief, sorry, during their brief life in this world. I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself and by planting beautiful vineyards. I made gardens and parks, filling them with all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs to collect the water to irrigate my many flourishing groves. I bought slaves, both men and women, and others were born into my household. I also owned large herds and flocks, more than any of the kings who lived in Jerusalem before me. I collected great sums of silver and gold, the treasure of many kings and provinces. I hired wonderful singers, both men and women, and had many beautiful concubines. I had everything a man could desire, so I became greater than all who lived in Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work. I wish that would be said today. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. What an assessment of life. 
This all comes out to be meaningless and chasing the wind. He goes on. This is in chapter 5, verse 10. Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. Certainly, I think you understand that. And I'll just conclude his readings in verse 17 of chapter 2. So I came to hate life with all that he had, with all that he did, with no limitations, no restrictions. The guy literally could wake up every morning and do whatever he wanted to do. And he said, I came to hate life because everything done here under the sun is so troubling. Everything is meaningless, like chasing the wind. Now, I, I'm thinking and believing you're probably, you could visualize this uh, as I did on wind chasing. It's, 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 it's intriguing, isn't it, how wind you can feel it, most of the time you can hear it, and you certainly see the effects of it as if it's something you can put your hands on. You feel it, you hear it, and you see the effects of it, and you want to grab it, just like everything else that you sense, that you feel, that you hear, that you believe you ha that has some value, you want to grab it and, and chase it and and go after because that's one other thing that I can capture. Now, if I was, uh, if I was on my way to, the, to my house and I saw you out in the parking lot when I'm leaving and I see you out there doing this and I walked over to you and I said, what's happening? How are you doing? And if you said to me, it's obvious what I'm doing, Pastor. I'm chasing the wind because I'm going to catch it. I'm going to walk to my house. I'm going to call the sheriff department. And I'm going to tell them we got a 5150 in the church parking lot. And they're going to come and lock your buck up, butt up in the Looney Tune. Did I just say butt? I didn't mean to say butt, but you got the point. But that's the mindset that Solomon describes that he had and oftentimes we have. We think that anything that we can get our hands on is something that we're supposed to pursue. It's something that we're supposed to go after. Now Solomon, he said everything under the sun is troubling and he's not teaching necessarily theology here so on the one hand, you know and I know not everything under the sun is troubling. But at the right, also there is, a, there is a statement here that he's making that certainly does apply to us that many things in life are troubling. Job said it this way in 14.1. He says, anyone born of a woman is short of days and full of trouble. Now... I can tell you, just knowing God's purposes and plan for our life and God being a good God, that life is not intended to be bad. It's not intended to be sad or disappointing. People shouldn't live life filled with escape plans, trying to find a way out, looking for exit doors or hidden hatches. All of us, for sure, have some bad moments in life. There's some things that's in all of our lives that are just not so fun. Events, occurrences, or, or tragedies. But, uh, but with that, I've come to know that the biggest part of the problem is not what happens to us or what we walk through because there's none of us that can say to anybody, nobody knows what I'm going through. That's not true because there's nothing new under the sun and there's nothing that's affected you in any kind of manner that hasn't affected someone else in the same way. But I do know that the, the, the issue here is that many people live life with the wrong perspective or the wrong objective. 
if, if you have an objective to live life pain-free or free from suffering or free from any kind of hurts, that, that, that's a fool's goal. That's just not possible. And honestly, having that object, objective causes you to miss out on the presence of God in your life. Suffering is, is unavoidable, and God has a purpose in all suffering, as you well know. But how we respond to it should be more so the objective. When I was meeting with the content and prayer team on Wednesday morning, I thought about something uh, that I, it was like a little leadership teaching that I heard years ago, and it just, something, somebody said something, and it triggered a thought about it. The, the, the guy was talking about uh, if, you had, if you boiled hot water and you had three elements in front of you, you boiled the hot water and you had a carrot, you had an egg, and you had coffee beans, you'll see a different effect on each one of them in the hot water. If you put the carrot in the hot water, even though it's now hard, it becomes soft. If you put the egg in the water, what's soft on the inside now becomes hard. When you put the coffee beans in the water, they change the color of the water and spread their effect throughout the water, absolutely, absolutely changing the whole environment of the hot water. And I think for many of us, life is like that. All of us, in one essence or another, are in, can be in hot water. But either we can be a carrot that just gets real soft, or we can be an egg and get so hardened that we can never go back to the way we were, or we can be coffee beans that changes the environment. It's a matter of perspective and a matter of objective. Some people live life with this mindset, I'm in it to win it which I don't really know what that means for life, in it to win it. Now, I know what it means to be in it to win it for a game or a competition. You can believe if I'm in any game or any competition, I'm in it for one objective, and that's to win. You'll never hear me as a coach get the boys together and say, listen, fellas, it's not whether we win or lose, it's how we play the game. <clears throat> No, that's out. No, no, no. There's one objective, folks. One objective, fellas, and that's to win. But to have that mindset about life is actually ridiculous. Because if I'm in a game with competition, I know who my competitors are. I can strategize. I can plan can perform and excel. I know who I'm dealing with. But in life, you don't know what you're up against. Because you can't control life. Things change. You, you have no idea. Today might seem like a great day until 3 o'clock you get that phone call that your father just had a heart attack. Or you can be doing great and you go to work on Monday morning, think everything's fine, and had no idea that the board has been plotting the whole time to shut the business down, and today is the day we're going to let everybody know or a new, uh, new person comes in into, into, into office and changes laws and changes things. You have no idea what you're going to face when you're, going, when you're in this life that we're living in. So therefore, we can't control it. So the mindset that I'm in life to win it when you don't know what you're going up against is, is pretty foolish. But in our pursuit and effort to win in this life, there's some things that, that can happen to us all, and I'm sure you can think of a, of, a, of a lot of things, but one of those things is that we get crippled by the past. We get crippled by the past. We, we all have one, and true, some people's past is a little bit cleaner than, uh, than others, but, but everybody's experienced heartbreak and failure and shame and disappointment, anxieties and fears. Everybody's experienced that. And there's those times in life when you just feel like you're right there in the place where you need to be and you're just one more move or one more decision or one more opportunity that somebody gives you and you think, man, this is going to be the win. And then something happens and your heart gets broken. You're reminded of heartbreak before or those fears from the past uh, rise up and, and, and bring you to a paralysis or just the anxieties. 
and, and it, it's like those things are almost persons, like they're personified, like as if, as if anxiety is the incredible Hulk or fear is like the bully that you had to deal with uh, on the playground and it can cripple you. Psalm 34 and 34 uh, and 5, this is why the psalmist said this, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. Because all of us got those things. All of us got those things in our past that can absolutely cripple and sabotage our pursuit of whatever life that you're pursuing. It's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an adage, but it's, it's the truth. That's, your windshield is, is big, but your rearview mirror is very small. You're supposed to have more in front of you than what you're looking for behind you. And sometimes we live life with a big old windshield and just have a small mirror going in front of us. But I'm telling you, if you keep your eyes upon the Lord, no matter what is in your past, it'll keep you from falling into those things because you're looking straight ahead. But the past can cripple us. You can be defined by culture. You know, the, the catechism, the first question is, what is the chief end of man or what is the purpose of man? And the answer is for us to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Glorify God and enjoy him forever. But oftentimes we let culture define us, which always takes away from us glorifying God. Culture does not exalt God. Culture does not lift up the way of God. Culture does not pursue the way of Christianity. And we can oftentimes, for the sake of trying to make it in life, find in ourselves adapting to those around us or those who we want to be accepted by or those who we want to be liked by or those who we, who we want to be in the in crowd with or those that are saying nice things about us. That always will take away from the glory of God in our life. Our objective should always be to lift him up not necessarily be concerned about whether we're going, doing things in the cultural way, not necessarily being trying to live from, away from being ridiculed or talked about or mocked because of we're living a life of Christianity in spite of what the cultural mores may be. Galatians says it like this, or Paul said it like this in Galatians 1.10. Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people but of God. Now, it seems like a simple statement, but I'm telling you, we do more things for people's approval than we realize. We get more affected whether if somebody doesn't say something about what I did or somebody doesn't like this or they didn't make a comment about my, my cute kid's video, which I think is exploitation, but that's a whole nother story. But, but, but they didn't say anything about about that. They didn't, they didn't include me in this. We do more stuff for the approval of people than we realize. But you can't do that and not take away from glorifying God. You can't do one and both at the, at the same time. So he's what, here's what Paul goes on to say. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. There's a hard line here. That a hard line that sometimes we miss because we want to walk that line of being cool with people and still glorifying God. And maybe you can if your objective was to glorify God and people liked you in the process. But my Bible tells me that if we get so close to Jesus and so much like Jesus, there's going to be some real issues with people around us. That's what the Bible tells me. There's a hard line here. And he said, listen, here's, here's the line. On the one side, you got pleasing people. On the other side, you got being a servant of Christ. There is no in-between. If it's pleasing people that's your objective, then you no longer can consider yourself a servant of Christ. If it's being a servant of Christ that's your objective, then you can't be concerned about pleasing people. Are y'all doing all right out there? And so... So winning in life is, is not defined by those things that people say yay and applaud to if that means losing the glory of God in your life and leaving it lacking. That third thought that I want to bring out is living 
for selfish purposes. And again, this is another one of those things that I think we can all get caught up in and think that everything that we're doing, we're doing for others, doing for family, doing for, you know, future and, and all of those things. And sometimes not realize at the end of the day, you know, we're really doing it for us. We're really doing it for our own mindset, our own self-gratification, uh, our own comfort level, and do things for a selfish purpose. Ecclesiastes 4, 8 says it like this. This is the case of a man who was all alone without a child or a brother, yet he works hard to gain so much wealth as he can. But then he asked himself, who am I working for? Why am I giving up so much pleasures now? It is all so meaningless and depressing. And at the end of the day, when life is pursued outside of, of seeking that real life that Christ wants to give us, I'm telling you where it ends up all the time. You, you end up enslaved, enslaved to the thing that you've created and the thing that you're making or the life that you're creating. You're enslaved to all the elements that go along with that. You're enslaved to those thoughts and enslaved to those actions and enslaved to that, those prides and those idolatries. Or you end up exhausted because you can't keep that up. You can't keep doing that over and over and over again and still getting nowhere. And then the end of that is just emptiness, complete emptiness. Well, let me, which is where Solomon emphasized. But, but let me tell you about, about God, God the Father, who, who really gets a, a bad rap as if God is against us, if certain things take place in life or, or, or we don't get what we want in life, we, we have this mindset that God is against us. If, if I had that accident and, I, and my car was totaled and God knows I can't afford to pay the car off and get another one, the thought is God is against me. If that relationship ended that I had that just completely broke my heart, or that marriage that ended, that I had no hopes or no desire that it would end this way, and God let it happen, then God is against me. Or if that child went in a totally different direction than what you were hoping and praying and believing and invested in, then God is against me. You're, you're starting from the wrong premise. You're starting from the wrong premise. If you let those things define whether God is against you, then you've missed the very thing that God has done for you that's greater than all of those things. Because the scripture says he sent his own son to die for you. Start right there. Well, well, my car wrecked and God knows better. He must be against me. But really, he sent his son to die for you. This relationship went real bad, and God knows how much I've invested in this relationship. He must be against me. But no, he sent his son to die for you. you you're, you're looking at the wrong thing. You're basing on how God's goodness is on things that take place in your life that you define as real life. And the Lord is saying, I started with the very premise that is real life, and that's sending my son to die for you. <laughs> sending my son to die for you. John 10.10 10 says it like this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And, and you, you, you got to understand that there is a devil. There's, there's a lot of theology out there talking about the devil is a figment of people's imagination or hell isn't a real place. Listen, folks, there is a real devil. There is an enemy out there. And he has a purpose and an objective, and that is to absolutely take from, destroy, and wreck everything that God wants to do for your life. There is a such thing as evil. The whole mindset that people want to say that everybody is good. In nature, everybody is good. No, no, I'm sorry. When somebody walks into a school and shoots up kids, that's evil. And don't tell me in the courtroom when the parents stand up there and say, and the boy didn't shot up six or seven people, but Johnny really has a good heart. No, he does not. That's evil. Am I talking to the right church? I wasn't mad in first service, but I'm getting a little, little anxious. That, that's evil. You got to know when people do some terrible things, ungodly things, it's evil. But that's the intent of the devil 
to steal, kill, and destroy, and to convince us, well, it's not really that bad. Mm -hmm. Kill, steal, and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Complete counter. The enemy comes to do this. God said, but I come to give you life. And, and even when you got some tough stuff going in your life that the devil really wants to overcome you with, when all that's going on, the Lord says, yes, that's a tough time. Yes, that's a tragedy. Yes, you're going through some suffering. But remember, he's trying to kill, steal, and destroy. But I came that you might have life, that you might have life and have it abundantly. And so with that objective, God gives us some promises, promises of what he can do, promises of what he will do that can benefit us all. If, if we believe in him and we trust in him, I think I got this from Webster. Webster's definition of promise is a declaration or assurance that one will do a particular thing or that a particular thing will happen. It's a definition of, of promise. God gives us promises. He declares certain things that he will do in our life. He assures that he will fulfill what he declared, what he said he would do, that it will happen. Now, people break promises. And all of us have broken promises that we had no intention of breaking. Circumstances change. Different things happen in life, and you couldn't do what you said you would do. We break promises, but God doesn't break his promise. God is not subject to the same factors as we are. He goes over and beyond the imaginable to keep his promise. Hebrews chapter 6, it's, it's, it's an obscure text, uh, although it's in the context of some things. But the writer of Hebrews refers to something that he doesn't explain here in this passage. Hebrews 6, 17 and 18, this will be on the screen. It says, God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it's impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. It, it's a wonderful passage, and I think you understand the heart of it. It's saying, listen, God has given us a promise. And he's also affirmed that with an oath, assuring us that he won't break it and he cannot lie. The, the problem with that, and I'm telling you for years when I read this verse, because I never connected it to where the writer of Hebrews was uh, talking about until I studied through the book of Hebrews, you might look at this word promise and oath and see them meaning the same thing. I give you my oath, I give you my promise. But it would be better to look at the word oath as covenant when he says both his promise and his covenant. These two things are unchangeable. And because God has given promise and made covenant, he cannot lie and he will not break it. Now the background of this is this. In Genesis chapter 15, there's a man by the name of Abraham, still actually Abram at the time, that the Lord had made some promises to in chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, the Lord comes to Abram while he's still with his family in Chaldea. And he says to Abram, you come away from your family. You leave your father and mother. I'm going to give you a land. And in that land, it will be yours but not just yours, but generations of people will have that land. And it's in that land that I'm going to establish the principles of faith. Through that land would be the one who would be the savior of the world or the Messiah. But it's through you, Abraham, and you believe and you having faith that people on this planet will also have a saving relationship with the God that's talking to you. Nations of people, generations of people, if you obey me and leave your, your, your family and go to the place that I appoint to you. Abraham did that. He left his family. You see his journeys in chapter 12. You see his journeys in chapter uh, 13, chapter 14. Then we get to chapter 15. 
And the Lord comes to Abraham, and now he's about 91 years old. And he reminds Abraham of the promise. He said, remember I promised you that nations will come through you. There will be generations of people who will believe in me. And it's through you that people will come to know me as a covenant and a promising God. Now, he comes to Abraham, and he reminds him of that in chapter 15. But at this time, Abraham responds to the Lord and says, how can that be that nations of people will, be, will come after me as an inheritance unto you, and I don't have any children? I don't have an heir. There's no one that this promise can go down to, 91 years old, Sarah's barren, I'm 91, I'm sorry, Lord, ain't too much going on in the tent at night. I got nobody. I got no child. And the Lord says to him, come up out of the tent. You look in the sky. What do you see, Abraham? He says, I see multitudes of stars. He says, that's how many children you will have. Count those stars. He says, I can't count them as multitudes. You're going to have multitudes of children. You're going to have multitudes that follow after me. You're going to have multitudes that have faith in me because of you. I made you a promise, and now I'm going to make a covenant. And so God tells Abraham to go get some animals. You can read Genesis 15. You're you're a church that reads the Bible, so just go read this. You don't want to miss out on this story. I could read it to you, but you're going to read the Bible, right? You're going to read Genesis 15 and read this story. So he tells him to go get some animals. And he's to take these animals and he's to cut them in half so that if it's a cow, uh, then it's halfway. If it's a lamb, it's halfway. He gave him the list of animals and the birds he was not to cut in half but to put on each side of this line. Now, There's some reasons on why he did that because one of the things they did in antiquity, it's not the only way that they did things, but one of the ways they did things in antiquity, when they made a promise to each other and there was no witnesses but two people, then they would say, listen, you bring an animal, you bring an animal, we cut the animal, we put the animal, we split the animal on each side, we get it prepared for a sacrifice, and we walk through making this promise to one another, and the animals are the witness of what we've just promised to do. That was one of the, that's the reason he did it that way. Now, here's the interesting thing. God says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. Abraham goes and gets the animals. He splits them. He cuts them. And he's waiting for God to come and bring the fire for them to walk through the smoke, etc., and do the, and, and uh, make the agreement. But God knows he cannot trust man's word. God knows he can keep a promise, but we necessarily won't keep a promise. So if you read chapter 15, God does something quite sovereign. He puts Abraham to sleep. Even though it's supposed to be the both of them that walk between the animals, God knows I've made a promise and I'm the one making covenant. So he puts Abraham to sleep so that Abraham cannot walk through the fire making covenant. Why did God do that? Because he walked through by himself to make the covenant. To say, listen, I've made you a promise, and now I'm the one making the covenant with you. I'm not counting on you to keep a promise to me, but you can count on me to keep a promise with you. And so God says, I've given you a promise, and I've made covenant with you. I cannot lie. I will not break it. It's unchangeable, and everything I promise you will come to pass. Can you say amen? So not one of God's promises fail. Joshua 21, 45 says, none of the good promises the Lord has made to the house of Israel failed. Everything was fulfilled. His precious promises are the sustenance of a a well-purposed life. Second Peter talks about what God promises us in this divine life that he's given us. Listen to this, and this should be displayed by his divine power. God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We've received all of this by coming to know him. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he's given us great and precious promises. Listen to this. 
These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. He's given us promises. Promises that puts us on that road and that place toward real life. And certainly those promises include salvation and includes deliverance and it de- includes restoration. That's the substratum of abundant life. And, th- and the question is, do you want to keep chasing the wind? Or do you really want life? Do you want real life? Because he- here, is, here is where it happens. And team, you can, you can come. Here's where real life begins. you got to make a big move. We use the biblical word repent, and I know it's just a good old biblical Christian word, but the meaning of it is it's, it's still the same. It's turn around. It's turn around from the direction that you've been going. Turn around from those things that you've been embracing that you want to call life. Turn around from those things that you've been trying to hold on to, that you've been trying to grab. Those those things that you thought you never wanted to lose, those things you thought you needed to keep, turn from those things that you've used as either a crutch in your life or to define what life is. Turn from those things. But not just turn from, but it's where you got to turn to. You see, because people can turn from addiction and turn right into emotional despair. People can turn from heartbreak and a broken relationships and turn right into another person that you made an idol. It's not a matter of just turning from something. We're not trying to make people reform. People can reform their life. Listen to me. People can stop doing drugs without Jesus. They can reform their life. But it doesn't mean that they've renewed. It doesn't mean that they've turned to the Savior that eternally cleanses them from all of their sins and gives them an eternal hope. And we're not trying to get people reformed. People need to be renewed. And so you can turn from one thing and walk right back into another idol. You can't turn from that and turn to something else. Repentance is a full turn into the loving care and arms of a Savior. It's the big move. It's putting back those things that are behind you, things that you've grabbed a hold of, and turn to the things that really bring real life. Y'all still with me? The Scripture says it like this, 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18, Therefore go out from their midst and be separated from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. It's turning from those things that you have considered to be life and turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's also a letting go, a surrendering, a surrendering of the life that you've created. And I'm not saying everything about your life is wrong, and some people are working where they should be working, have the career they should be having, living where they're living, bought what they've bought. But it's that part of life that you don't want to let go of that's less than what God has for you. It's, 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 it's that part of life that you've created and you keep working to uphold and, up, and, 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 and build up. It's, it's those things in life that you really believe define you and define who you are. And without them, you don't believe that you are the person that people see you as or present you to be. Jesus said, give up that stuff surrender. And listen, listen, I know losing things is tough. I know giving up things is tough. But, but, but for some folks, I'm telling you, and hear me on this, I don't know who you are, but some of you in the relationship, you need to give up. You've made an idol out of it. It's jacking you up. It's destructive. You're not just living with a difficult person. You're in a destructive relationship, and you're trying to build a life with something or someone that God is saying, give it up. Give it up. Some of you might need to change from what you're doing because it's not a job or a life that glorifies God. And maybe what God is directing you to may not be the same amount of money, but who cares if you have life? And and believe me, giving up stuff and losing stuff is tough. Now, I didn't go this deep in in first service, but this is all y'all's fault. Evidently, I don't know, and and I know I'm going a little over, but I didn't preach that long the last three weeks, so you owe me. 
But, but, but listen, you got to hear, I know, listen, losing things and some things we actually hold on to that mean more to us than we think. And we don't realize until we lose it. I was sharing with the first service in our, in our move, all of our boxes was in the places where they were supposed to go. All of our stuff. This one particular box had some stuff in it that I could put away in the room, but, I, but there was parts, the bottom half of that box had to wait till our bedroom was finished before I could set that stuff up. Finally got everything in its place, everything in where it belonged uh, in the house. And it took a few days for, you know, furniture and all that stuff to get to where it belonged. But when it was time to put up the stuff in this box that was in my room, the box was gone. All of my watches, and if anybody knows me, I'm a watch guy. I probably had a dozen watches. All of my wedding bands outside of the one I was wearing. All of my foreign money that I've collected over the years in my travel. And all of my Yuma Catholic Championship rings with my name on them. All of that was, was gone. Looked and looked and looked, although we knew where the box was. Looked and looked and looked nowhere. I had dreams in the middle of the night. One night in particular, I got up three times. I had a dream that I was being shown where the box was. Got up one time at two something in the morning, ran to the garage, and I'm going to the garage thinking, I know we didn't take the box back to the garage. It's been in the room the whole time. But I'm stirred by this dream. Go in the garage and break open every single box, which was just stuff from my office. Break open every box and turn it upside down. Go back to bed, probably slept another hour, hour and a half, had a dream that the box was in my shop. Got up at 3.30 in the morning, went to my shop, broke open every single box, looking for that. Finally realized these are just dreams, the box is not there. Cried for three days. All my foreign money, all my championship rings, all of my watches. It hurt. The only way I got through it, and you may think, oh, that ain't nothing. It's just watches. It meant something to me. You may say, oh, it's just wedding bands. It meant something to me. You may say, oh, it's just championship wings. And after all, it's YC anyway. It meant something to me. Had my name on it. All my foreign money. That meant something to me. But I'm telling you how I got over it. When I realized that stuff doesn't define me. I miss it, wish I had it, and no, I didn't answer in first service, never did find the box. But I tell you what I do have that I'll never give up and nobody can ever take away, and that's real life with Jesus. That's real life with Jesus. And so he said this, Mark 8, 34 and 35, then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of good news, you will save it. The wisest thing you can do is to give up what you cannot keep to have what you will never lose. And that's life in Christ. And here's the last thing, and that's commit to a relationship with Jesus. Commit to a relationship with Jesus. Only through him will you get free from this grip, this life death trap that you're in. Only through Jesus will you get over this failure trap. It's only through Jesus that you'll be totally set free. The only way to have real life is life in Jesus. I'll close with this verse, John 8, 31 and 32. To those who believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Everybody stand if you would. Prayer team, come. Thank you, team. Great job today. Great job. Listen, uh, every head bow and every eye closed, I'm just going to make this real short and simple. But you, you, you know how you've defined your life. You, you know the, the traps that you fall into. You know the mindset that you have. You know the life that you've tried to create and hold on to that's just causing you exhaustion that's just wearing you out. And at the end of the day, it's just empty. It's like buying cotton candy at the fair. It looks pretty until you sink your teeth into it and you realize you just got nothing. People are doing that with life. 
But if you want real life and if you want to start a real life today, you're in the right place and this is the right time. Real life where you're pursuing what Christ has for you that will never fade away, that will never rust, that nobody can take from you, that will never be lost. A real life of his goodness and his presence and him walking through this life with you. The stuff that we suffer here on earth, there is a light that comes from God that gives a perspective and a hope of keeping our faith in the radiance of his. With, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here, I'll, I'll pray for you right where you are. If you want to start today a real life with Jesus, just raise your hands. I'll pray for you right where you are. Right where you are, I'll pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you back there in the back. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, I want to thank you for these five, Lord God, that's said with the hand up, I want to start a real life today. Lord, you know what that's going to mean for them. You're able to help them through that process. There may be some things that they keep. There may be some things that they stop. There may be some things that they start. You're able to walk them through that with wisdom and with grace that they may absolutely embrace a real life that comes from the Savior alone. So, Father, I'm praying that this moment, this time, Lord, as they make this commitment to you, that this be the first day of a new life for them. And, Lord, I pray for each of us that we may walk, Lord God, in the right direction. Whatever we got to turn from, help us to turn from it and turn entirely and completely to you. We may carry this cross, but embrace the life that you've given us. Father, we thank you and we love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Listen, we're going to go into song of worship. If you made a commitment or want to make a commitment to Jesus, these dear folks can help you. They also can help you at the connect table. But I encourage every one of you to leave this place hearing what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to you, that you may embrace the life that only comes from Christ. Give up that stuff that you're trying to create and make a life out of and get the life that Christ has given you. God bless you. Have a great day.
to get water baptized or you would like to join a city life group or you want to come to open house there is a card in your seat back it explains how to do that or you can just stop by the connect table in the lobby and there's people there that will walk you through that i also want to tell you if you have surrendered your life to jesus today tear off this red piece on the bottom of your card and take it to the connect table they have a gift for you but they also just want to meet with you and kind of walk through this